Hi, and welcome to the Getting Off the Pill for Good webcast. My name is Grace Emily Stark, and I'm the editor of Natural Womanhood. And I'm Cassie Moriarty, your associate editor of Natural Womanhood. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Natural Womanhood, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to women's health and fertility. Uh, we exist to empower women to know and understand their bodies, to encourage couples to adopt natural methods of family planning. And today we're really excited to present this webcast called Getting Off the Pill for Good to help women in their transition off of hormonal birth control um, or what, whatever type of birth control they may be on um, to kind of give them some encouragement and to let them know that there are resources for them and that it doesn't have to be as scary or as big as they're making it Yeah, out. we did a survey with a lot of our readers and viewers and, um, you know, it's a, big, it's a big step and a lot of people, I think, do feel scared of it. But the majority of the people who answered our surveys talked about how much better they felt off of the pill. They were surprised to see that their libido came back, their energy came back. Um, they just felt different. They felt, you know, and another um, one of the quotes I'm thinking of is someone was worried about how their relationship would uh, be affected by this. And they were pleasantly surprised that, it, you know, it actually gave them a chance to improve their relationship. Um, what were some other things that people said? Yeah. So some of the other positive things we heard were weight loss, uh, no longer feeling bloated, no longer hold, holding on to weight around their midsection. Um, you know, women are often told that the pill doesn't make them gain weight by their doctors, and yet they experience something completely different. And so when our readers were surveyed, we had two or three, at least two or three stories of women who were surprised to have lost some weight post pill. Um, but on the flip side of things, we want women to go into this transition with clear eyes. Uh, we want to be honest that getting off the pill can come with some difficulties. Um, some women mentioned acne returning. In fact, that's a very common refrain that we hear in women who are considering getting off the pill, that they're afraid that the pill that they had prior to getting on the pill will come back, the acne that is. Um, and some do see that happening. Uh, that can be for a few different reasons, which we're going to talk about in our webcast interviews today. And there are other issues too. Some women get off the pill to try to get pregnant and they may find that they're having difficulty doing so. And so we're here today with this webcast to give as clear of a picture as we can to women who are considering making this big change in their lives to let them know that there are alternatives on the other side of the pill. There will be resources for them to navigate things like post-pill acne um, and to also just encourage them that they're getting off the pill might actually pay in dividends uh, in ways that they can't even foresee yet. And in both of my interviews, we do go into depth. Both of our interviewees this month are, are pretty, they're strong experts in this field. Um, I am pleased to introduce our first interviewee, uh, which is Dr. Lara Bryden. She's a naturopath based in New Zealand. She's also um, an author of the Period Repair Manual, the Hormone Repair Manual, and she's done so much work in this field. She has a wealth of knowledge. I'm excited to share her with you. So as you can probably hear from my accent, I'm Canadian. Um, I started out actually working in evolutionary biology in Canada a long time ago, 25, 30 years ago. And then I trained as a naturopathic doctor in Toronto. And I started out in general practice, but quickly started focusing on women because that's who was coming to see me. And then in the early 2000s, I moved to Sydney, Australia, and I lived there for almost 15 years. I had a very busy clinic there, hormone clinic. And out of that work came my first book, Period Repair Manual, which is all about how to have healthy periods without hormonal birth control. And now I live in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, where I also have consulting rooms here now. And I've since then released a second book, which is for women over 40, which is sort of one of my new passions. That's exciting. Um, so the <clears throat> the topic of the month for that we're doing, you know, these interviews about is getting off the pill. Okay. A lot of women 
are nervous about getting off the pill or they've already done it or they've heard things from their doctor that they, you know, either should or shouldn't do it. So like just off the cuff, like what's your advice for women getting off the pill? As you can imagine, it's so individual. I know everyone says that, that's kind of cliche, but it truly, truly is. I guess the starting place is just the very first piece of information that I'm, as you know, I'm trying to get out there that I think is very important is just to explain that pill bleeds are not periods. So Mm -hmm. for anyone who's been prescribed the pill to regulate the period, as you know, that makes no sense. Like that's not a reason to take the pill. So I guess that would be in part an answer to you. If you're taking the pill to regulate your period, then no, there's, there are better solutions than that because of course there's value in having a natural ovulatory menstrual cycle. I'm a cheerleader for women's hormones. Natural cycling is how we make hormones. So that gives you an angle. I mean, I'm obviously not a fan of hormonal birth control in general, but I will at the same time acknowledge that um, it can have its place and certainly it can help to avoid pregnancy. There's no question about that as as we both agree, there's other ways to do that. Um, but, and also contraceptive drugs can help to relieve some symptoms of menstruation, like distress, like endometriosis and strong premenstrual mood and things like that. I, of course, in my work and in my books, I offer alternative strategies for some of those symptoms, but I just always phrase it this way, just for those, that person who's listening, who's thinking, oh no, you know, I'm different. I can't come off the pill because, you know, whatever it is, I've got these severe symptoms. So There's usually a way off. I think the better place is to be off the pill. For a lot of women and a lot of women who contact natural womanhood, they're in this place of they did get on the pill for painful periods, endometriosis, PCOS, like these things that we don't have concrete, easy answers for. Um, And so they're fearful about getting off because their symptoms most likely will come back. Um, or I don't know, maybe you know something different. No, um, of course they will. They, they, they'll, they'll, as soon as you unmask the periods, as you start having real periods again, yeah, the, whatever was the underlying issue going on with your periods is, is still there. Um, so what would your advice be for someone in that position where they know they have a hormonal disorder, but they're scared to have to, you know, tackle it? Trust your body. You know, this is the key message. You know that my first book, Period of Pair Manual, ends with the sentence, trust your body. This is true. I would say, you know, and I've worked in this field for 25 years. I've worked with thousands and thousands of women. Everyone always thinks, just to say again, everyone always thinks, oh, I'm different. My hormones are, you know, too messed up. I'm too broken. I can't have cycles. I can't, you know, have healthy menstrual cycles. I would just say to everyone listening, you... You almost always can. I mean, there are maybe a few very unusual situations where the symptoms are just too strong. But in most cases, there's another solution. So PCOS is actually one of the best examples of this. Um, Should we just talk about that for a minute? Because that's that's polycystic ovary syndrome. That's a reason, a hormonal imbalance, certainly a reason a lot of women are put on the pill. And it responds incredibly well to supplements and diet changes, as well as actually there's a treatment called cyclic progesterone therapy using natural progesterone that can help with that condition. So that's just sort of a a sampler of some of the other kinds of interventions that can help. And then the benefit is you get your own cycle back. Like you actually reverse out of the symptom picture of PCOS and essentially reverse out of PCOS. And then you have normal periods. And it's very empowering. I mean, I can say this from the work with my patients and my readers. It's so Women are so happy to get their own cycles back. It just um, makes sense, right? Because it's a sign that your body's working, that everything's working, not just from, partly from a fertility perspective. Of course, that's very reassuring and good to be ovulating regularly. But even for women where, you know, fertility is not their goal, it's important to ovulate regularly because it's how we make hormones. It's how we build metabolic reserve. And this is for long-term health as well. Um, Reduction of risk of uh, heart disease, for example, and dementia and healthier bones, all of that 
we're, we're healthier in all of those ways by ovulating regularly. And also I would point out, actually, I think there's a reduced risk of breast cancer from regular ovulation. And that's really to do with the benefits of progesterone that we make with ovulation. And I, I know I said it earlier, but I just have to say it again. There's no progesterone in any type of hormonal birth control. They, it always gets called progesterone only or progesterone IUD or that's not progesterone. And that's one of my other key messages is I have a blog post called the crucial difference between progesterone and progestins. It's a really big deal. And I'm quite a stickler for um, using the right words for things. That's one of the ways I'm trying to influence women's health is so we can be a little more precise in our language about, you know, what we're talking about. And progesterone is such an amazing hormone. It's like it's but it's the Cinderella hormone, right? Like it sort of gets pushed to the side and it deserves to be kind of more center stage. I think in my own um, teaching, uh, people hear about estrogen. Like I call estrogen like the magazine hormone. Like we hear about it on the magazines at the supermarket, but progesterone is like the one that does like a lot of the heavy lifting. Like the estrogen is a fun hormone. It makes you feel like you have a lot of energy and everything, but without progesterone yeah. you wouldn't benefit from estrogen. It's true. Um, one thing I notice is like, including myself, almost everyone is progesterone deficient. It seems, yeah. I don't know if you feel that way. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, progesterone is hard to make. So estrogen is quite, is easy to make. Um, progesterone, and just an interesting thing about progesterone, fun fact, in a healthy menstrual cycle, we make 100 times more progesterone than we do estrogen. So it's it's no shirker, right? Like there's a large amount of it if we can get there. And I have a blog post called Roadmap to Ovulation. As you know, ovulation is just hard to do. Ovulation, I mean, when you're healthy, it's easy. And, and women do ovulate monthly and that's great. But like there's lots of obstacles to ovulation if you're under eating, if you have insulin resistance, if your thyroid is not great, if you're missing literally any nutrient, (laughs) if you have too much stress, like all of those things can either blunt, like sort of, you know, blunt ovulation and have a shorter luteal phase or less robust progesterone and or just completely not ovulate, have an anovulatory cycle, which we know that even healthy women with normal hormones do have quite a few anovulatory cycles. It's just, it's the body is constantly monitoring the situation and kind of the brain's deciding, am I healthy enough to make a baby right now? It's like this every month check-in, am I healthy enough to make a baby? And that's how it's going to be able to make progesterone. <laughs> and the fact is that's true Even if you don't want a baby, I mean, this is the way the body works. If you're going to have healthy hormones and healthy menstrual cycles, your body needs to at least be convinced that you are healthy enough to have a baby, make a baby. And so that's a big part of why progesterone is quite often deficient. It's just really hard to make. And we only get a, you know, couple decades of the, at the most of making it. We, from our like early twenties to late 30s mid to late 30s and then progesterone starts to go down and that's second puberty or perimenopause that's our 40s a lot of the heavy periods and anxiety and a lot of the symptoms in our 40s come from the drop making less progesterone than our brain and uterus and breasts were expecting and that side of things in our 40s is I mean that's just an inevitable part of perimenopause I mean yeah. I would just sort of reframe that that's nothing we've done wrong but there so we it's this precious time we get to make it for maybe 20 years at the most and if you switch that off with hormonal birth control then you don't get to make any progesterone which is really sad you know some someone might come off the pill and feel 100 times better right away yeah and then some women don't feel better right away and they're like oh I have to get back on because this is this is terrible what's the time limit like what 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 can they do to to get through that yeah good it's a really good point yeah so for some women it's it's just a breeze they come off they feel great um coming off so it it depends on two things I guess to just to try to simplify it depends on what your periods were your real periods were like before what the symptom was whether if we're talking about premenstrual mood if we're talking about endometriosis pain if we're talking about skin 
irregular periods, those all have slightly different timelines in terms of how quickly they return post pill and also how quickly they might take to resolve. And then the second factor is which pill are you trying to come off? Because I'll speak specifically to trying to come off Drospirone or Yasmin or Yaz or Cipdrone, which is, um, I don't, you don't have in the States, but in New Zealand, it's a very popular um, oral contraceptive is using um, a strong anti-androgen drug called Cipdrone. So coming off those drugs, so let's say Yaz or Yasmin, That's an anti-androgen drug. So there will be, especially if there was, if there were skin breakouts before, there will then pretty much almost guaranteed be post-pill acne that kicks in, not right away, but usually within three to six months of stopping the pill. And that can be worse skin than you've ever seen before. And that's part of a drug withdrawal syndrome from that anti-androgen drug. So there's like this kind of massive upregulation of skin oils, sebum. And so that would be someone who, just to tell you, you know, what what I hear from my patients is they had, you know, mild breakouts as a teenager, they were put on that pill, which works beautifully for skin. And then, you know, at 28, they're like, I'm going to try coming off. And then six months off the pill, or maybe nine months off the pill, they're like, oh my goodness, my skin is like horrendous and then they're th- and then they're probably diagnosed with PCOS at that point that's partly the kind of post pill PCOS that I talk about in my book because it's not hard to get a PCOS diagnosis even if it's temporary and then they're like okay I'm I'm broken clearly like my hormones are just messed up like I, I can't function like this I must need the pill so then they go back on the pill so then the problem is like any amount of withdrawal from that drug that they'd managed to get through in that six to nine months, they're kind of back to square one. So eventually they're going to have to come off that drug. So I have, I've written about that. I work with that a lot with my patients trying to make a plan for post pill acne. It's usually about getting zinc in place, which I'm a big fan of zinc for skin, the supplement. And then, you know, looking at sugar, maybe in some cases looking at dairy products and maybe making a plan to avoid those normal dairy at least not forever but for like a year or two during that post pill time so that's an example post pill acne can take a couple years so that's kind of the maybe the one of the Mm. longer ones let's say premenstrual mood would be have a different timeline it's often it can flare up pretty dramatically in the first few months of the pill as your own hormones start to kick in there can be quite a big sort of histamine response as you start to make your own estrogen and maybe not ovulating great to start with so progesterone's not kicking in there's different factors and then just your hormone receptors themselves adjusting to a real cycle um, the brain adjusting to an actual cycle and so that, the, the, like I say to my patients, just, you know, brace yourself. But if you have bad premenstrual mood in the first couple of cycles off the pill, that doesn't mean that's how it's always going to be. Like that's just your body kind of getting used to this really, in some cases, brand new situation of an ovulatory cycle. So that gives a, a couple of compare and contrast. And then, of course, there's the whole... Yeah issue of like period pain and if it's endometriosis that's a longer term project usually of trying to identify if that's what's going on so yeah it basically takes a lot of patience it does it's trust your body though I think I just keep coming back to that because your body wants to ovulate it wants to be healthy in every individual there's it's possible to feel a lot better than you do I'd say for the vast majority of women, it's possible to get to symptom-free natural cycles. Um, Barring, I would say, obviously, if you're in your late 40s and heavy periods and perimenopause, obviously, that's a different situation. But for young women, I mean, the goal is robust, healthy, natural cycles that are symptom-free. And for those that are coming off the pill and are trying to conceive, what is your general timeline? It depends what we're talking about. I guess I would say usually three months three months to kind of have some ovulatory cycles and, you know, good egg quality. And I'm not sure how, I mean, I guess we have to also factor in cervical fluid and things like that, but normally I say three months and then also three months is kind of the magic point to where I might do some blood testing at that point. Like I'd say, you know, give it three months. If you're not ovulating, let's after the pill, you know, that let's then do some blood tests to try to work out 
what factors might be preventing ovulation, for example. Thank you so much for being yeah. here. Uh, my last question is, what's like one thing that our viewers and listeners can do today to improve their hormonal health? Well, the, I just, I'm going to bring it back to the question of, are you ovulating? Because that's how everything makes sense. And I, I, need, I know, you know, possibly your listeners already know all about this. So maybe that doesn't, is less important for them. But I know certainly for some of my readers and followers, they're trying to answer questions about estrogen and progesterone without understanding that ovulation is how you make progesterone. <laughs> it's like the center event. So that's what I would say is if you're trying to understand female hormones and the menstrual cycle, kind of bring it back to that. And what are the potential obstacles to ovulation? Because that's what, yeah, that'll, that's what will individualize treatment. Wow. So a lot to unpack from that interview, Cassie. Um, the first question I want to ask you just right off the bat is, is what really stuck out to you most uh, in your conversation? with? Yeah. Dr. I mean, we got into so much, you know, so, so much helpful information, um, one of the things I love that she talks so much about was the importance of ovulation. And I think for a lot of women, when they're in that decision making process of should I get off the pill for a lot of those women, they may not even know that their periods they've been having on the pill aren't like real periods. Um, and so I think like Dr. Bryden just had a good way of like unpacking that, like it's not a real, you know, a pill bleed is different. And um, the, the other thing that was so um, just good to hear from her is about the importance of progesterone. And I love the way she put how progesterone is a hard, it's an expensive commodity. It's not something that you can just get you know, easily. And prioritizing women's health so that we can ovulate so that we can make progesterone. Because if you're not ovulating, then you're not making progesterone. Um, and then I also appreciated how she just looks very holistic, holistically at the body. You know, she has a way of looking how one change is going to affect something down the road when it comes to our periods. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Let's just unpack that statement a little bit more. I, I feel like it's really important. This pill bleeds are not periods. You know, Dr. Bryden really hits home on that. Why is that not just an issue of semantics to call it a bleed versus a period. What's the right, significance right. Of, a, of a bleed versus Because, a I mean, as you and I both know, if you're not ovulating, then you're not making progesterone, which is such an important hormone for balancing out the estrogen we experience in the first half of our cycle. And um, you and I have talked about this before, but, you know, I call estrogen like the, the spring and the summer hormones. Like, it's very exciting. There's lots going on. And then but like, it's not always spring and summer. It's like, we need fall and winter, which is progesterone. Um, right. And we've done extensive, we've done a series on natural womanhood about the importance of ovulating for not just our hormonal and reproductive health, because yeah, progesterone is super important if you want to try to conceive. It's super important if you're, you know, um, like trying to have a healthy pregnancy, but it's not just about making babies. It's about our bone health. It's about our heart health, our immune health even our breast health. Um, and so if you're on hormonal contraception and therefore not ovulating, therefore not being exposed to progesterone, there's a whole list, laundry list of things, you know, that are affected by that. So what else really stood out to you uh, from this interview with Dr. Yeah, Cassie? I mean, we talked about, you know, a lot of, one of the reasons women get off the pill is to try to conceive. You know, they've been on the pill for however long, then they decide, okay, I'm ready to build a family. And that's like a scary, it's a scary place because they've not ovulated or menstruated naturally for a while. And so like, they're like, well, what do now, like now they suddenly really do care about ovulation specifically. And so we talked about things you can do when you're in that period, you know, in the, in the trying to conceive, um, phase and, um, and then we, you know, we touched a little bit on fertility awareness methods, but I think that is a really wonderful piece of all of this is like, okay, so if you're getting off the pill, then what are you doing instead? Like, what is, you know, what are you replacing it with? And if you're trying to avoid pregnancy, fertility awareness methods got you. If you're trying to achieve pregnancy, fertility awareness methods got you, you know? So um, such an amazing tool 
uh, we didn't get as much into that as I would have liked, but we talked about a lot more, you know, so. Yeah. And I think to that point too, um, it's such a great, uh, example of how radically different fertility awareness methods are versus birth control, right? You can use them to postpone pregnancy, but at the same time, you're still able to tap into what your body's doing. You're still able to see, you know, the natural ebb and flow of your cycle and you're not doing anything to stop it from happening. So when you do decide that you want to get pregnant, you know, it's not this decision where you have to stop taking something and, and hope that your body starts doing what it was supposed to be doing again all along. Um, because you never stopped your body from doing what it was supposed to do in the first place. Right. Um, you were just working with that ebb and flow of your fertility to, you know, meet your family planning needs. And that's a really, really critical point, I think, to make, um, when we're talking about, you know, fertility awareness versus birth control and how fertility awareness isn't just like natural birth control. I want to encourage everybody who, you know, saw this interview with Cassie and Dr. Bryden, who, you know, they're looking for a little bit more. They want, they want more information. They want more from Dr. Bryden. Um, we are going to be releasing the full interview because this was actually just a little taste. Um, and we have the full video interview going live on our site on the Getting Off the Pill for Good webcast landing page um, that's going to feature the whole uh, interview with Cassie and Dr. Bryden. You talk about things like libido, what you can expect in terms of your libido coming off the pill, um, get a little bit more nuanced about what your cervical mucus is going to look like coming off the pill. And so if you want to hear more about those topics, I really encourage you in the coming days to visit our website and to go watch that full video interview with Cassie and Dr. Brighton that we were so, so thrilled to be able to, to get to share with you all. Um, so Cassie, on that note, transitioning, you did another interview with another very knowledgeable, very interesting person, Dr. Lauren Rabal. Can you talk a little bit about what we're going to see and uh, in that interview with her? And about yeah, yeah. Shared? I mean, I had a blast with both of the interviews, um, but especially Dr. Rabal. She is a fellowship trained infertility specialist. She is a reproductive endocrinologist. She's based out of Newport Beach, California. Um, and we, we really got into, it was funny, you know, just a little bit different information, same information, but different information on getting off the pill. She talked a little bit about some of the things that we can do to support our hormonal health. Um, like regardless, you know, of where we are again, like whether we just got off the pill or we've, if we've never been on the pill, what are some things we can do today to, um, to ensure that, you know, we're supporting our hormonal health. Um, we got into some, some sort of philosophical questions about like, why do women experience these issues and what can be done about it? Yeah. Without further ado, here's our interview with Dr. Lauren Rabal. Grace and I interviewed you for the natural womanhood podcast and, um, which was such a, such a fun episode, but we learned about your background, how you were in the IVF industry. And so I think that background probably has, well, it has to have, you know, influenced your work. And I think that there's this idea that, you know, okay, you're on the pill until you want to get pregnant. Then once you want a baby, then you come off the pill. And you and I both know that, you know, there's a lot of stuff like it, it isn't probably super recommended to just come off of the pill and get pregnant the very next month. And very often those people who were on the pill for any type of cycle issues may encounter issues conceiving. So what is your advice to people who are coming off the pill to get pregnant? Yes. Great, great question. I mean, I think that, um, I think that the first caveat to say is that you, women absolutely do come off the pill and, and can get pregnant afterwards. Okay. But with that being said, again, we're trying to set ourselves up for success. We're trying to optimize everything that's in our control to do. And that's why this is helpful to kind of have a good plan as you um, are preparing to go off your birth control pills. And so the way I think about it is really to first, um, it's really in circles. And so the first circle is let's bolster your nutritional status. Okay. And this is going to not only be important 
for your for your general health, but it's also going to be important because we know that birth control pills affect certain of our micronutrients and vitamins. So for example, many of the B vitamins may be associated with um, lower levels of them while on birth control pills, um, vitamin C or E, as well as vitamin D. Interestingly enough, there are some studies showing women who have just gone off birth control pills may have lower levels than women who are who have been off of them. And then again, some of the of the minerals even, so selenium, magnesium, maybe other nutrients that we want to, again, make sure are um, normalized as much as possible as you're considering going off of them. And then again, just for general health, okay? And so um, that's one part of nutrition. The second part of that is, again, how food, food is medicine. And so really uh, adopting a diet or nutritional changes that can help with decreasing inflammation in our body, that can help with decreasing insulin resistance, which can contribute to other hormone imbalances. Insulin is intimately involved with um, certainly androgens, which is a fancy way of saying male hormones, of the most common of which is testosterone. Um, and again, that brings us right into that pathway of polycystic ovary syndrome or PCOS. That's so number one cause of irregular cycles. So that's one example that, um, that that's really that first layer that I think of when women are starting to consider going off is let's get, let's get that piece of it uh, worked out. Um, I would say that the second layer is to really focus on how do we help with estrogen metabolism best? And the answer for that in many ways is number one, with making sure our microbiomes are optimized. And so that's a fancy way of saying um, the good guy bacteria that are in all of our different organs that help us um, protect us against the bad bacteria, but also actually are involved in metabolism. And so specifically for estrogens, um, there's this concept of bacteria in the gut that help regulate and um, and metabolize the estrogens in our body. So that's another opportunity is to really work on the gut to ensure that we have good metabolism, that again, there's not an increased risk of immune system activation, which can occur with what we call dysbiosis or an imbalance of those gut bacteria. And then as well as supporting the liver and making sure that the liver is really able to function best. Our liver helps us detoxify uh, bad substances in our body along with the kidneys. They help excrete toxins. And there are different ways to, to really support that, be it, be it supplements, um, be it avoidance of heavy alcohol, for example, or other factors that might affect the liver. Um, certainly uh, in changing your types of fats to good fats as opposed to trans fats, okay? That might be another way. Um, and then finally, the last part of detoxification is actually excretion through the, through the GI tract. So bowel movements, and that kind of goes hand in hand with that gut microbiome and, and taking care of that. So that's another layer. Um, and then I would say that after that is really, again, considering if there was a history or the reasons why that woman was on birth control or hormonal contraceptives and trying to piece together, well, if this was an issue before, how can we tailor our evaluation of this and address this again in a holistic way? So an example for this uh, could be, well, if a woman was on as a teen started birth control pills for terrible cramps with their period, could this potentially be a harbinger of endometriosis that can be up to even 70% of teens with severe pain with periods. Mm -hmm. And if so, again, how can we focus on diminishing those cramps? How can we uh, decrease inflammation involved with this and starting that process? One of the things that we've written about a lot at Natural Womanhood and writers, uh, excuse me, readers have mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, asked us questions about is, they want to get off the pill, but they're scared because of these symptoms that they experienced however many years ago before they got on the pill. And, mm -hmm. and it's also sort of well-known that sometimes acne, particular, particularly acne, but other symptoms like will worsen before they will get better. 
Um, so what would you say to someone who is in that position where they're scared of these symptoms returning, like with a vengeance, um, you know, how would you allay those fears? Yes. I mean, I think that first of all, you know, I, I think that it, it could potentially have a shift just like anything else. There might be a washout period. Okay. Again, how do we set ourselves up for success? And so to understand that for that patient, I would say, first of all, let's take the acne as an example. What were the circumstances surrounding the acne before? Was it associated with irregular cycles as well? which makes us think more like a PCOS picture potentially, okay? There are other causes that are rarer. Um, was it something where it was very much related to the period? Um, and, and so it was more that hormonal um, menstrual uh, presentation of acne, okay? Was this something related to the foods that they eat and potentially dairy, for example? Um, and so there are different reasons why people get acne. And so if they can remember, not always people can, but if they can tie that, then that's the specific area that we can start working on. And so again, for the dairy example, um, they can already go ahead and um, see if they have any other symptoms that, that indicate um, this insensitivity or this intolerance to dairy. Gut, gut symptoms are very common, um, rashes um, and whatnot. And if so, then we can go ahead and modify this either by using um, different types of milk um, alternatives or even A2 has um, lower allergen profile. Um, and, or again, really working on the gut, believe it or not, because that um, uh, if the gut becomes leaky, um, what that means is that barrier that normally protects the 80% of our immune system that resides within the gut from the food products, um, that barrier, normally the immune cells can't see it, but when that barrier becomes leaky, it can then, the immune system becomes sensitized to whatever food product that is. And then this becomes a, a vicious cycle of inflammation of potentially immune system activation. And so again, that's, why am I mentioning that? Because then we heal that part of it. We close that. And then we also, again, are setting that patient up for success that it will minimize that portion of it that um, isn't necessarily due to the hormone shifts. It's due to another issue. Right. So that's one specific example. But I would say to kind of think back in your history and try to determine, okay, well, what do I think this is related to? Um, again, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of food as medicine. So talking to someone who can help devise a good plan, again, based on your symptoms, um, I do like to tailor it because everyone has a varied cause of what's going on. Um, and then finally, you could consider certain um, supplements to support yourself again, depending on that cause. And the minimum I would say to do, which is a good start for all of us, is a basic multivitamin or a prenatal vitamin if you are of um, childbearing age and um, are considering getting pregnant. Um, those would be a few basic options. And then you can talk to someone to really hone in on those specific concerns and, and have a good plan. Yeah. Do you find a lot of, a lot of the patients you work with, um, have food intolerances or I don't know if I'm using that word, right. But, um, mm -hmm. where they need to cut out certain things. You know, I, I have to say, I have of course a special, you know, I I'm having a, a certain subset of patients who are seeking me out. So again, we have to take kind of my patient population, maybe with a little bit sure. of a result <laughs> too, right? Because um, a lot of them, I do, I do find that there is a good amount of overlap, unfortunately, uh, with the conditions I'm seeing women for these hormone imbalances and with this inflammation, with this immune system activation. I'll tell you, I see a lot of women who have, yes, these issues with their gut or who have thyroid issues. Interestingly enough, birth control pills may be tied to increased risk of, um, yeah, of autoimmune, uh, issues as well. Okay. So, so yes, I would, yes, yes. The answer is yes. But I'll tell you again, the silver lining or the part that to really focus on is that I have seen amazing improvement 
with these lifestyle changes. We don't need to necessarily go on more pharmaceuticals Mm -hmm. to heal people. Um, And sometimes we do. And of course, I'm not averse to it. We just have to really have a very, again, holistic plan in place. But it's really heartening to see a woman who's had debilitating pain with periods. um, And we decrease their inflammation, her inflammation through a variety of techniques, be it modulating environmental toxins, be it instituting supplements to kind of calm down the inflammation or help with free radicals be it the food component, so, so important. Okay. Be it normalizing whatever hormone imbalances she's dealing with. And, and we have, and, and they're better. They don't need anything else, you know? Yeah. It's, so, and that that's, must be so rewarding. Yeah. Um, well, obviously in natural womanhood, we are big proponents of fertility awareness methods. Uh, I think they go kind of hand in hand with sort of the type of care that you are giving people. Um, you know, this idea of looking holistically thinking about, um, I always talk about when I, when I teach, um, cause I teach fertility awareness, I always think about how much information we can get from a chart without drawing a single vial of blood, you know, like we don't need, I mean, sometimes you do have to draw blood and, and get more figures, but, but it's just such an important, like biomarker for women to have. Um, so for someone who is getting off the pill and interested in using a fertility awareness method, um, what types of advice would you give you around that? Yes. I, I mean, I am with you. You're, I love, um, fertility awareness methods because again, I like data and I like empowerment and I like understanding that wo- that woman understanding exactly what's going on. And that's what it brings. It allows, it allows us to demystify what is happening during the month and really get in control of this part of our body and our life. Um, so I am, I'm a huge fan of that as well. Um, I will tell you, I think that the best method, well, what do those methods do? Those methods are surrogate markers for ovulation in many ways, right? And that's what they're measuring is that as there's a shift in this beautiful, as I've talked about before, this beautiful cyclicity of the hormones that happen throughout the month, um, that because of that, those impact different um, systems in our body that we can then measure, be it with, cervical mucus as it shifts and changes in relation to estrogen and progesterone, be it with, um, with our thermometers or temperature as it rises in response to progesterone's effect, be it with even ultrasound monitoring or um, urinary hormones, uh, again, blood hormone. I, I do like to draw blood. So I, I have to say, I do get a lot of blood on my patients, but, uh, but yes, you can do this non-invasively and I, and I very much encourage them to do so. Um, what I would say is that the best method is the one that is easiest for that woman. And That's so, what I, I always say. So the one 100%. that is the best yeah. is the one you'll use. <laughs> Absolutely. And the one that I I tell everyone, my number one goal is to try is not to increase your stress. That is kind of my one of my mantras, because I think that, um, oh my goodness. I mean, I think this decades just alone has been incredibly stressful. I think there's a lot of stressors in, in modern life. Um, And I think that again, the patients that are seeing me, unfortunately, if they're trying to conceive or having difficulty doing so, or even don't have a period regularly, it is incredibly stressful to be waiting for that to happen and have no idea and wondering every twinge or ache or change in discharge, what that means, okay? And so I don't wanna contribute to that. I will say that um, cervical mucus is a very easy one for most women. Why? Because we, it, it's not something that requires any fancy gadgets to do. You can check on wiping, okay, even. And we know that within three days of noting that mucus, that ovulation will occur. And so it really is a nice guide that most women, if they are experiencing it, they may not be, okay? And that's something else to be addressed. But if they're experiencing it, that's a good way of kind of tuning them in. Okay. This is now I should expect my period a couple weeks after this, for example. Yeah. I found um, in just the years that I've been teaching, I found that I always tell people like, don't split hairs over it. Don't split hairs over like different adjectives of cervical fluid. Like, do you have it? Do you have it? <laughs> because when people split hairs over it and they're like, is it this? Is it that? It's like, 
it's, you know, um, I mean, sometimes if you need to get down to the nitty gritty, that could be helpful. But uh, the work we've done at Natural Womanhood is, of course, making these methods more accessible to women, because I think that's another reason why people don't want to get off the pill is because they're scared and nervous about this, this very foreign or seemingly foreign um, method that they're not sure what's involved. They know that some people use thermometers. They know some people use, you know, a a monitor that you buy. Some people use stress. It's like very overwhelming. So Mm -hmm. um, I love the idea of simplifying it so that you can take that fear piece. Because another huge piece of it is like people are scared to get pregnant. Like that was why they were on the pill. And it's funny, even people who are trying to conceive, I think, the years of hormonal contraception use like puts this like fear of pregnancy in you. And Mm -hmm. even if they're trying to conceive, there's still this, like, it's hard to switch that gear, you know, like I think, I think the pill or any type of hormonal contraception just, it it was like that for me anyways. Like I remember like shifting gears and being like, Oh, that's new. Like (laughs) to go from being terrified of pregnancy, like it's the worst thing that can happen to you. It's not, but, um, (laughs) I think, yeah. So I don't know. Where I think is. you're right. I think that we, it's, it, it is like shifting your brain and then coupled with that fear of the unknown. Yeah. That's, that can be a very, and then the fear of having a resumption of symptoms, those things can all be deterrents right. because at the end of the day, we're, com- we're creatures of comfort. It's so much easier to do things the same. It's so hard to make a change. Right. But I'm telling you that, um, again, it really I I, I encourage people, yes, to look on your site because um, you don't have to do all the things. You just have to pick one, Mm -hmm. okay? And then you can layer on depending on how you like it, okay? And if you don't like it, you switch to a different one. And I think that's what's so nice about um, the world these days. We're so interconnected that it is easy to find this information in a palatable way that you can kind of watch a five-minute video and you're like, okay, (laughs) I think I get, I think I can can move forward with this. Um, Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's, yeah. And I talked too about how these methods, I mean, I myself have used so many different methods over the years because my needs have changed my, you know, like maybe I use multiple biomarkers when I didn't have any children. And now that I have two kids and like your, your just goals change, your needs change. And that's one thing I love about these fertility awareness methods is that you can mix and match, you know, um, there's a lot of, um, like almost, I don't know if clinical work is the right word, but there's a little bit of like trouble solve, you know, like trouble solving where you're like, oh, it can be this or that. Um, Mm -hmm. And customization. You can customize to what works for you. So what, like, what are your final thoughts on, um, like, is there anything we didn't touch on? And, and I guess what, what I've been asking as the final question is like, what is one thing that someone can do today for their hormonal health? Like, what's the one thing you would recommend? Yeah, great, um, great question. Um, in terms of the one thing that I would recommend for hormonal health, I would say it is to really sit with yourself and think what part of your life right now, um, first of all, do, do you feel like you want to make a shift in? And specifically what I would say is a, for a a lot of people, it is with our nutrition. Um, I would say at least in, in the people changes that I see for me personally, I think it's hard sometimes to maintain that. And we kind of, you know, you fall off that wagon a little bit, but um, again, the vegetables alone have so many wonderful antioxidants. They have so many um, components within them that are designed to really keep us healthy and provide those nutrients, again, that are being depleted by various pharmaceuticals, by, by um, birth control pills. And so if, if the one thing I would say is um, eat or more organic, because we know that's going to significantly decrease your risk of pesticide exposure, can impact both men and women. Okay. So that's one easy one, three quarters to 90% decrease in, in, in exposure. And then to try to focus at least one meal a day on having half your plate be vegetables and fruit, a quarter protein, a quarter um, a complex carbohydrate. That's a great start. Okay, you're already um, uh, repleting yourself, even if the crops are, you know, maybe not as pure and wonderful as they were 50 years ago. But still, that's already a shift for a lot of us compared to how we're currently eating. 
So that'd be one thing to say. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, again, if you're if you're feeling uncertain, I am also a big fan of having your brain trust, of having experts surrounding you and guiding you and looking at data points to, to minimize that, that risk that you are going to have a lot of um, untoward symptoms or resumption of your symptoms. Um, so, so, I, so I do think plug yourself in with someone who, um, who is an expert um, for this, number one. Number two, what I would say is to really, again, besides the multivitamin, um, I would consider even an, a methylated B vitamin on top of that. And I think that um, a, a fish oil um, or increasing um, the omega-3 intake is also a really wonderful um, option for th that many of us, again, aren't getting quite sufficient. So those are kind of some basic um, nutraceuticals that um, most people that most people won't have an issue or contraindication or risk by taking um, would be something. And I would say that if you have any, again, if you're having any mood symptoms, if you're having any, again, decreased libido is another one that I hear a lot of. Mm -hmm. Truly, when you stop, you, I, again, this is my anecdotal, like, experience, but it also is borne out in the data. People do feel better. Okay. We know that there, I didn't, we didn't really go into the risks of birth control. Um, but there are significant issues that some women may have while on the pill. And so despite how easy it is there, you really may just overall feel better off of it. So there, again, the silver lining is yeah. what to focus on. Um, there's a lot, uh, Sarah E. Hill in her book, she talks about how like, it's like taking the glasses off for a lot of people or rather putting on glasses, I suppose. But like, it, it's like this total, like, like their brain literally operates differently. And so that feels different, you know, to go from, um, being on the pill and not having exposure to those cyclical hormones and then suddenly experiencing your own estrogen and progesterone, like that's huge, you know? Um, well, that you're, you're absolutely, you hit the nail on the head, as you know, that, um, that the hormones have receptors in the brain and that we know that different combinations or different, um, ex times of exposure, be it estrogen first and then progesterone together, um, produce markedly different manifestations in mood and concentration and decision-making um, than this flat line of just unopposed, um, continuous progestin dominant um, uh, in negative, input. Negative input. Yeah. yeah. So, um, um, so absolutely. There's physio, there's a physiologic basis for for that analogy that you're saying of, gl of glasses, which I love. That's it. That's a for a lot of women, especially if they were put on the pill at a young age, like they might not even know, like, you know, if they were put on the pill at 14 and they're trying to get off of it in their late twenties, like they may not even know what that feels like. They've never known, like all they've known is, is this sort of suppressed like cycle. So I love that idea of um, kind of waking up, putting on glasses and of course, like having a support team around you, like getting, you know, appropriate uh, reproductive care, getting, you know, um, nutri a nutritionist or someone that can help you with that. So, um, right. And then also, even if you don't immediately do that to really be tracking in some ways, again, not in a stressful way, but even just getting an app and kind of plugging in again, the mucus just on noticing or when your first day of your period is, or even if it's not coming regularly. And so if you aren't having a period and it's been 35 days or more, and that persists for a few months, that really is a signal to go in and talk to someone really at that point. Or if you're having very heavy bleeding, that's longer than eight days, or you're filling a pad an hour with blood all the time, or again, debilitating cramping. Those are some examples where you, it, let's, let's get some answers to yeah, help. And there's no right? reason to wait either. Yeah. I mean, I, I have friends who say, oh, well, you know, the doctor said to come back when I want a baby. <laughs> and it's like, well, these symptoms are more, are, it's not just about having a baby. If you have painful periods, like 
Absolutely. That's not normal. That's not normal. <laughs> you have to suffer through it, you know? Exactly. So that's why I'm so grateful for your field. I'm so grateful for practitioners like you who are like willing to take women seriously because Mm -hmm. it's not always been the case. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I can't wait for all the viewers to, to hear so many, so many nuggets of wisdom. Oh yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me, Cassie. Yeah. I hope that was helpful. And, um, I think that, Again, it, it's it's important to shift our mindset to empower yourself. And so the people who are watching this are already on their way to that, which is which is a wonderful at the minimum first step, you know? Yep, yep. To moving forward. <laughs> well, another excellent interview, Cassie. Thank you so much for doing that for us. Um, so what I want to hear from you now is what was the takeaway from Dr. Rival? What did you what did we get from talking to Dr. Rival Rival that maybe we didn't quite get from our interview with Dr. Bryden. Yeah. I mean, it was such a delight to interview her. We've interviewed her before in the natural womanhood podcast. So I knew when we, you know, when we put her on the roster, I was like, Oh, that's going to be such a great interview. Um, I love that she got into some like actual tactile, you know, supplements and, and just like basic things that you can do today to support your hormonal health. Um, And then we also, like I said, got into these kind of philosophical, like it felt philosophical, Um, and then I love, like, you don't have to do it all, right. It's like, you don't have to do all the things, but if you can just do like one or two small things, like that is something you can do for yourself today. Like getting off the pill, you may not have to implement all these million things. Um, and so I thought that was a nice message for, for women to hear, um, I, she has such a wealth of knowledge about nutritional status. I love hearing about, you know, the work she's doing in integrative medicine. Um, and of course, like estrogen metabolism, that's not something that I think about in my work frequently. Um, and of course, talking about fertility awareness methods, right? Like we didn't talk about that as much with Dr. Bryden, but like how to use a fertility awareness method after the pill, what are the biomarkers, what um, I, I love this idea of sustainability because fertility awareness isn't the same thing as the pill, right? If you're coming from this like mindset where you're like, oh, I'm just going to take this thing at five o'clock every day or the IUD where it's like, you don't set it and forget it. Um, I like the idea of, okay, we'll do something that is going to work for you long-term. If you're going to implement this new method that does require daily observations, how can we make it you know, efficient and effective for you? Right. Yeah. And I think uh, the thing that I took away that was really powerful from her too, is that we don't want women to be stressed out about this transition, right? Stress is the enemy of your hormones, right? We've we've written about that at Natural Womanhood. We've talked about it on the podcast. Um, So telling women who are trying to get pregnant, you know, oh, just don't stress about it. It's like one of the most stressful things. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And so don't feel like, you know, you have to go to your fridge and take everything out and then go to Whole Foods and only, you know, shop in the organic section at Whole Foods for the rest of your life and, um, you know, get on all the supplements today. You know, Dr. Ruval, I think, does a good job of, of giving us some concrete things that we can do today. You know, things as simple as just get on a prenatal vitamin, you know, even if you uh, aren't looking to get pregnant, that's going to have a lot of the new nutrients in it that might have been depleted by your birth control pill because you know they've known that the birth control pill depletes key nutrients in women's bodies for a really really long time the science has been there for that but yet again it's not something that you know most doctors are aware of so it's not something they share with most of their patients and it's you know largely unknown among women that you know hey your body is not able to use the B vitamins in your food at, you know, optimal capacity. So let's maybe get you on some of these vitamins, some of these nutrients, um, trace minerals that your body, you know, even though if you were eating a healthy diet before your body couldn't necessarily utilize those nutrients while you were on the pill. Um, and so, yeah, just, you know, starting small, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, and knowing that, you know, there are options for you to make this an achievable, healthy transition. Mm -hmm. You don't just have to flounder, um, through it all. And she talked 
So yeah, she talked about too getting like a team of experts around you. And um, I also would like to mention, you know, we didn't talk too much about this in either of the interviews, but NAPRO and FEM are two organizations who do really important work in that area of um, trying to get to the root of your hormonal issues, you know, irregular periods, painful periods, recurrent miscarriage. Um, And those are two wonderful resources that people can utilize when they find themselves in that position. Right. So if the lifestyle changes, that's always like kind mm-hmm. of the first thing we start with. Right. And that's really what Dr. Bryden and Dr. Rubal um, spent most of their time talking about was what are the lifestyle changes that we can address up front when women are trying to get off the pill? Um, but again, if you get off the pill and you're experiencing, you know, the same heavy periods, the same irregular cycles, the same pain that you were experiencing before, um, there are resources out there that can take it that next step beyond lifestyle changes, which might not be enough for some women. If you've got rampant endometriosis Mm -hmm. or, you know, huge swollen ovaries full of cysts, you're best option is not the birth control pill to get back on it. Your best option is to treat the root cause of those issues. And like Cassie just mentioned, there are natural procreative technology, NAPRO technology doctors, uh, FEM, F-E-M-M trained doctors who have protocols for dealing with these issues. You know, they range from hormonal supplementation to even some surgical options Um, none of which are the Band-Aid solution that, frankly, the pill is. So you can get help for these issues, um, and you don't have to just rely on the lifestyle lifestyle changes, even though those are great. You know, for some women, that's not going to be enough. And so we want our our readers and our listeners to know that there are other options available. Um, And you can find out even more about those options and different resources on the naturalwomanhood.org website. Um, In particular, our landing page on uh, getting off the pill. We have an entire web page now just dedicated solely to this topic with, you know, a dozen plus articles that get um, go very deeply into, you know, what one can expect when getting off the pill in terms of their mental health their libido, what their relationship with their partner might look like, what you can do about post-pill acne. Um, We get really in depth on these issues that concern a lot of women when they're considering going off the pill and and trying to go off of it for good. And so we really want to encourage people who, you know, maybe still a little bit on the fence, who still need a little bit more information before they're ready to take that plunge and get off the pill to visit this webpage the, on the naturalwomanhood.org website. Thankfully, it's front and center on the homepage for you to click on um, and get access to all of these resources and to hopefully, you know, give you the confidence to make that transition today. I okay. also want to mention um, that similar to Dr. Bryden's interview, we'll be releasing a full interview of Dr. Rabal as well. Um, both of what you saw in this webcast here are just sort of snippets from the full uh, interviews. So you can access both of those full interviews on the landing page. Yes, thank you for mentioning that, Cassie. Um, And so to wrap up, I just want to thank Cassie. I wanna thank Dr. Rubal and Dr. Bryden for helping us inform more women. Um, And I wanna ask uh, anybody who's listening today, if you like the work that we're doing and you feel called to sponsor it, we are always looking for sponsors. Um, in a variety of different ways in the work that we do. Um, And, you know, we need help. Uh, We're up against, this is a David and Goliath kind of situation when we're talking about how to get this vital, uh, really, you know, can be life-saving information into the hands of women and couples everywhere. So um, if you'd like to know more about how you can sponsor the work of Natural Womanhood, please reach out, find our website, um, and maybe we can together, you know, get women informed and empower them. At the end of the day, that's what we're all about here at Natural Womanhood. So thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, And please uh, visit our website and use all the resources that we have for you. Thanks for watching. Bye.